Yeah. So uh, I'm, 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 I think it's uh, in five days, it will be six years officially in, in Chicago. Um, so been out here, uh, started off in Evanston. I was out there for a couple, couple years uh, in grad school, getting my MBA uh, at, at Kellogg School of Business at Northwestern University. Um, and then during that time, you know, I was making a career change. So prior to that, I was at AT&T doing more general management and uh, wanted to go into marketing uh, and wanted to work for, you know, a company where marketing was the main de decision maker. So um, trying to blend that with my love for, for sports, I was looking at companies like PepsiCo, um, Nike, uh, and so forth, and um, ended up interning while I was in grad school at, at PepsiCo. Uh, in Chicago, uh, interned on the Tropicana brand, which was not not the Gatorade brand that I was aspiring to be on, uh, but fortunately, kind of through some through some networking and, and, and serendipitously, was able to f land onto Gatorade. So, uh, been working in Gatorade for four years. Um, during that time in marketing, I've had a, a series of roles. I've done kind of more of that traditional brand management. Uh, I've also done a couple different um, innovation roles. Right now, I'm currently uh, on digital innovation, so it's much more of a tech-forward role, uh, especially at a CPG company. Um, but we're we're building out a digital fitness like wellness app, and um, we're going to be launching a, a Gatorade sweat patch, which is a, a new to the world innovation, which is kind of exciting. So um, able to work on some good stuff, and um, and so far so good. So uh, tell me a little bit about how you got to in the Northwestern and, you know, I know you got, I don't remember what scholarship, you know, you got, can you talk a little bit of what's your experience like in Northwestern? Yeah. So uh, I remember when I got my job at AT&T as 2010, I just graduated University of Oklahoma and I was, I was ecstatic and I was like, man, I've got, I've got a salary, I've got benefits. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm, 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 in, I'm cush now. I'm, and, uh, I, you know, my first year at at and it was, it was all fine and dandy. I didn't necessarily love what I was doing, but I was like, Hey, I'm getting paid every two weeks. I got a check coming in my bank account. So I'm, I'm happy. I made it, you know? Uh, and I think it was like coming around on year two. Uh, I, I realized like, man, I, I really don't enjoy what I'm doing. And I have no passion for telecom, uh, and I know, you know, and I, I know you spent so many, so much time in the telecom industry, and I and I was like, man, like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Like, did I go to college so that I could be working for the next thirty years and then retire? Um, and I realized, like, I should be doing something that I feel a little bit more passionate about, or something that piques my interest or gets me more excited. So. Um, I had some peers uh, that were, uh, I worked with some colleagues at at and and um, a few mentors who said, Nick, you should consider getting your MBA. And uh, I said, well, I never thought about grad school. I certainly don't want to pay for it. Uh, I don't really know like what I would eat, what degree I would get. And they said, you should, you should get your MBA and you should go to the best school that you can get into. And there are different programs in place that, um, whose mission is to help uh, in, in increase the number of diverse representation in senior leadership positions. And that all starts through kind of matriculating the business school. So uh, I joined this program called MLT, Management Leadership for Tomorrow. It's actually uh, founded by John Rice, who's a Kappa. Um, he played basketball at Yale and he's a Harvard Business School alum. And, and he, he basically said, you know, we're not seeing enough diverse representation in business. There's not enough people who look like me. I'm going to help create this program to develop a pipeline uh, to get, you know, smart, educated, bright, black and brown people um, into business. So uh, I did that program, which is much more of a prep focused program to help you think about like why you want to go to business school, help you think about your story that you'll articulate in your essays. And then there's a few conferences where you get to meet a lot of like-minded people who are kind of in the same boat as you. So I, while I was in Dallas, I did that program. And uh, then I, I ended up visiting several schools, uh, Duke, Michigan, um, Berkeley, Ke Kellogg, 
uh, and uh, I applied to five schools and, and fortunately I was able to get into all five and um, it came down to, to Duke and Northwestern uh, Kellogg and um, I chose Northwestern uh, just because I thought it was a good fit for me and I liked I liked the location uh, I wanted to get out of the south and uh, I wanted to knowing that I was interested in marketing, uh, Kellogg was a great marketing school. And I liked that it was like in a college town, but also like right next to Chicago. So um, I, I had the best, I mean, I, I think I'd like to say I had the best two years of my, I think the best two years of my life there. Um, I was able to travel the world. I went to like 35 countries, which is, you know, crazy to even for me to even say um, and just met some of the brightest people I've ever met there. Um, all the while, you know, still able to have a really enjoyable social life. And, you know, there's something to be said when you're like in a class full of bright people. There's also something when you're, you know, having potluck dinners and you're traveling the world and you're doing all of these um, social events with those same people. It really allows you to forge uh, meaningful relationships. So, um, yeah. So, uh, what you, you graduated from uh, Kellogg? What year? Twenty sixteen. Uh, Twenty sixteen, and so uh, and uh, your your scholarship you got because there was like some was that through that uh, management leadership that you got the scholarship. So, so uh, it's funny. Um, there's a program that is called Consortium, and yeah. they partner with. 18 of the top like 30 business schools and rather than applying to different business schools individually you can apply and fill out one common application and you can select which of their partner business schools that you want to send your application to and then you just have to write like one school specific essay for each of those schools um, and so it's like a one-stop shop you save money on application fees and what happens is when your school receives that application it goes into a different pile than everyone now you're still gonna be evaluated on like, does this person have the chops to get into the school? But if you then are accepted, you are automatically up for a, scholar, a scholarship to get like a half fellowship or a full fellowship, which I think you actually were my uh, recommender for that. Um, so funny enough, I, I, I applied to three, three schools that were in the consortium program. Um, but my, my top two candidates, which were Duke and Kellogg, were not a part of the, the consortium. Mm -hmm. And uh, funny enough, I got a full ride at Duke, and a merit-based scholarship, and I got uh, like basically three-fourths of my tuition covered from Kellogg. And I actually got more money from the non-consortium schools, which is like, mm -hmm. you know, very untraditional, uh, than I did from the actual consortium schools. So, so tell yeah. me a little bit about, uh, you know, your time at the University of Oklahoma and you know, about becoming a Kappa and what your experiences were like there. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kappa Alpha Psi is a non-hazing fraternity. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um, no, so I think, I mean, I think for me, what was a little bit different about, about, about my perspective is that I was a cap leader. So I was, I was a little bit more aware of like of fraternity, black fraternities than a lot of my, you know, black peers at North at, at Oklahoma, just because they weren't exposed to any kind of cap league program or, or whatever is similar that other fraternities do. So when they came, when they came to campus, they were really kind of learning everything for the first time where when I came to campus, like it never even crossed my mind that like, I knew that I wanted to join that, that bond. Um, so it was a little bit less of a discovery phase for me than I would say for most college students. Um, but I, I ended up pledging uh, my junior year. Um, yeah, my junior year. And so I crossed 2009 in the spring. Um, and uh, we, uh, I'll never forget when I walked into the province meeting at the middle of us, I saw you sitting there. And uh, that's been one of the most surprised, you know, things I've ever had in my life. But yeah. it was 
surprised. <laughs> <laughs> um, they actually they actually had a line my freshman year, um, but I I at the time I was I was uh, I was trying to play basketball and kind of just busy with some other stuff and and pretty tied up with school and. Uh, I knew that they'd be taking a line every year, so I wasn't too concerned about it. And then my sophomore year, when I when I went for it, um, our th- th- it was just very very disorganized, and our line was it was somewhat of a mess. So we actually had to hold off until the following year. So that's why I had it. it ended up crossing my junior year. I was the uh, I was the only junior. We had no seniors, and I was the only junior of my line um, of eight people. So. But anyways, yeah, so during that time, I was, um, what was I? I was the, was I the, was I the MOIP chair? I think I was the MOIP chair uh, the following year, my senior year. And then I actually was the, was the dean. I brought, I brought the, next, the next group over after mm-hmm. me the following year, the dean of pledges. So I um, was able to kind of get them through that process, which was, which was a lot of fun um, in terms of just like, like being being kind of like the guy who's responsible for bringing the next wave of people over, um, you know, you kind of you get you get to see that transformation that they go through, uh, which was which is kind of nice. So, um, yeah, I had a had a great time being a cap at Oklahoma. So uh, let's go on further back. So tell me about your experiences being in Kappa League. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> that. So Kappa League, I, I, I had a great time. And I think, you know, Kappa League is a type of thing that's it's extracurricular. And if you're not, if your heart's not in it, you, you, there, you, you, there's no point in half-assing it. I was like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So uh, I think for me, what I just, what I enjoyed was, well, actually a few things. Uh, I remember specifically, we learned about stocks and bonds, which at the time, a lot of it still went over my head, but the fact that like, I don't learn that in school, I'm not really exposed to that and, and we're talking about it. Um, I, I really appreciated that. Um, but I would say what I learned more than anything was public speaking and just getting comfortable sp- speaking with people. And that's like speaking with peers, but also just speaking with adults because of all the Kappa men that were, that were at the meetings uh, and at the events. So I think for me, um, you know, we always closed every meeting where you had to go up and, and kind of introduce yourself. And then uh, you had to give like one news story and then you had to say like one, something philosophical or something. And, uh, you know, it, it'd be interesting to look around and you got some, everyone's different ages and you got some people, some kids who are just scared out their mind, who are shaking in front of everybody. Um, but I think just being put in those uncomfortable situations prepared me for being in those same situations years later. Um, so I think the exposure that it gave me was incredible. Uh, the focus on community. So like, I think one of the first things I did was like make phone calls for the, to help out with the Ron Kirk campaign. If you remember that. Um, and uh, just doing things like going to the food pantry and helping out. Um, so I think I learned like the, the value of giving back. I, I think I, I pride myself that, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in paying it forward. And I think most of that came from my time as being a Kappa leader and like probably didn't appreciate it until later, all the Kappa men who like showed up every week or, you know, however often we met to kind of be there to guide us, to teach us, to educate us. You know, they took time out of their busy day. They have families, they have jobs. And, you know, when you're a kid, you, you don't really think about all those things. And as I'm getting older, I realize like, when you're in your thirties and when you're a man, you know, probably in your forties, you're probably stressed as hell about all different things in life. But when you, when you showing up every week and, and you don't really, sh- all, all, all I see is these cap of men who are here to help us out. Like that, that meant, that meant a lot to me. I, uh... I miss having y'all at the house for basketball camp. Man, I that. <laughs> look forward to it every year. This is probably the first year. Y'all didn't, obviously, I didn't do it this year. No, obviously, yeah, this first year, we haven't had it since since you guys were, you know, since we started with you guys. You know, you guys were, were my first, you know, group that kind of started, you know, here in Dallas, it started and went 
all the way through. So y'all have a special place in my heart. So what's, uh, well, I mean, what do you see? What's next for you? What's on the horizon for, for Nick? Yeah. Um, so I, t I told myself, I'll say professionally, I told myself that um, going, into, going into PepsiCo, going into Gatorade, that I'd probably be there for three to five years. And I'm coming up on year four. And I think for that, it's just because I, didn't int I don't intend to be a lifer um, at Pepsi. And, and I know that the value that I'm getting from being where I'm at right now is, is that, like, that, that hard marketing training, the marketing skills that only a lot of like, big CPGs are able, consumer packaged goods companies are able to deliver. Uh, and I feel like I've been able to get that. So as I think about what I want to do next in my career, um, I definitely want to go somewhere that will be a slightly less like corporate and bureaucratic um, where I have a little bit more freedom to, to kind of move around at my own pace. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in either staying in like the sports industry or possibly tech or possibly like the entertainment industry. Um, and, you know, some of those less tech, but more sports and entertainment have been industries that historically have not placed as high of a value on MBAs. And I think over the last like five years, they've started to place higher value on that. So um, it's, it's definitely like a networking game uh, with those specific types of industries, uh, which, which I've been able to, you know, during my time at Kellogg and, and other organizations that I've been part of, I've been able to kind of grow that. So as I, as I have my time here in, in COVID to, you know, I'm, I'm busy as hell with work, but, you know, I have a lot, also have a lot of time to think about what the next move could be. Um, I think I want to get one more experience uh, at, my, at my current company. So um, I should be probably getting a new role in the next few months, you know, barring how this, everything in the pandemic pans out. But uh, once I get that next role, it'll be a title bump. And then that'll kind of open the aperture of like what my options could be externally. So then with respect to like where I live, um, like I said, I bought a place in December. So uh, I'm completely comfortable with the idea of moving since I've been here for six years. I've, I feel like I've, I've gotten what I need from, from the city and I, I, I enjoy it here, but it certainly doesn't feel like home, if that makes sense. Um, so I think long-term, would be great to, to get back to, to Texas and even Dallas, but I think it doesn't have to be my next move. Um, so I think my career and, and what other opportunities are next, that'll probably dictate where I go uh, from here. So, uh, so tell me, how, how, so how many total countries have you been to now? I'm at 48. 48. So, so how do you, how, how, how do you swing that? I mean, particularly when you were in <laughs> school, how, how did you swing good enough? You know, that's, a, that's a question I've always had. We have a term, we have a term in business school called your, your B school rich. Uh, and I was certainly B school rich. Um, uh, no, I think it's a couple things. One, you have a lot of time when you're not in class. So like your holiday breaks are very long. You get a full week, sometimes two weeks for spring break. You have a summer intern in the full-time program. You have a summer internship, right? Cause I'm not working. So it's, I'm a full-time student. So uh, classes you know, will end spring semester at, you know, X date in May or June, depending on what school you're at. But your internship won't start to like mid June, so you have probably a week or two if you wanted to do travel. And then um, for me, my internship ended mid August, but classes didn't resume until mid September. So I have four weeks on the back end. Uh, and so when you're, you know, there are, some of the travel was through classes that I was taking um, with Kellogg specifically. Every incoming first year student has the option to go on an international trip. And the international trip is always led by five of the rising second year students. Um, so during the course of the year, as I, as I was a first year student, um, I, along with four other of my fellow first year students, were planning to take a group of students to Vietnam for the following August, right? So we plan all year. Um, so when you get accepted into Kellogg or when you accept your offer, essentially, um, you get a list of like, 
25 countries that are, that are options for trips and uh, you get to rank prioritize like your top 10. And then it'll be like randomized and then you'll get randomly assigned to a trip. And so basically before you even start classes, you just traveled with 25 people to Portugal or to Asia somewhere and you're, you know, forming really, you know, good relationships with them and you're kind of already starting the school year off with some best friends. So you have things like that. And then it's a bunch of type A people in business school, a bunch. So think about the type A personality, like, oh, I see this flight deal. I'm just, hey, let's plan. I'll plan everything. All you got to do is show up. So uh, it's kind of a mix of everything. So, so, so what did you learn from all, what have you learned from all your travels? Uh, I learned how deprived I was as a child for not traveling. <laughs> no, I, I didn't, I didn't have my path, my first passport until 2013. So I was 25 then. So think about that for, to tell us 25, I never really traveled outside the U S I did, I did one carnival cruise with like Steve and his parents, like literally that was it. So, um, I think for me, I realized like how big the world is and um i don't know my favorite thing to do when i travel is there, there's a couple things i always have to do i've always got to drink the local beer i've always got to go go out one night to a bar it doesn't have to be crazy because that gives me a glimpse into how the locals you know interact and and and, and all that and then um, i always like to just meander like just walk, walk, walk the streets with no game plan and kind of see how the day develops. And I think get, getting exposed to like doing that in, in Singapore, doing that in Vietnam, doing that in Spain, like there's just so much that you see and that you learn. Um, and it made me realize how much that I don't know. So then I'm like, it makes me curious to like, all right, now I'm even more curious than I was. So um it's interesting because, you know, I, I think you remember too, like I got to a point where I was traveling so much that like my parents literally didn't know what country I was in. <laughs> and, and then like, you know, a lot of people can't put their head around being someone being in Luxembourg or whatever. You can't even imagine what that looks like. So like, it's, it's very interesting because I, I, I don't even talk about my travels that much. A lot of it is like I travel with different groups of people at different time and we have that experience or... I did some solo trips and like, that's just something that I have for me. And it's, it's, it's very, it's very interesting. Well, I said kind of getting ready to, you know, I want to respect your time, but yeah. Uh, so you want to summarize your Kappa league and Kappa experience, you know, what, you know, what, what would that be? Yeah, I think, um, I feel like for me, Kappa league gave me, uh, it rounded out all the things that traditional school didn't give me. And I don't mean to make it sound like Kappa League is this like super educational thing with, you know, lots of homework and tests, but it, it, it just rounds you out with a lot of the intangibles that you don't pick up uh, in your traditional school environment. Anything from, you know, how you interact with your peers and your friends, how you interact with adults, learning about tax and stocks and bonds, um, community service. And I think, um, you know, you're also, you don't know it at the time, but you're exposed to seeing this, this impenetrable bond that all the adults around you have. Um, and, and you're kind of like in the back of your mind, like that's, that's special. Like I want to be a part of that. Um, and I think it just, it, it, it gave me so many, gave me social skills like having an acute awareness when I'm in social settings and how to talk to people, public speaking. Um, yeah, and I, I, I just think it's, it's so valuable for so many people. But at the same time, um, I think you only get out of it what you put in. So uh, for the people who, you know, take advantage of that opportunity, I think, you know, it can be very fruitful. Uh, and then with respect to just my my own personal experience, we actually didn't talk about this. So maybe I'll just spend a couple, I have, I have a couple minutes uh, if you do. Um, but we didn't talk about like my activity, my involvement when I graduated. So when I, when I came back to Dallas, um, you know, one, I mean, I immediately got involved with Richardson Plano, right? And even, even though I was living in Dallas, you know, I was still making the reverse drive up north of 75. Um, 
but it, it was like a no brainer to me. And like being the director of achievement um, and like being able to, to lead the scholarship committee and, you know, kind of handpick with along with, you know, the committee handpick the, the students and the applicants that we want to give the scholarship to and then having the actual s ceremony reception and planning that like it, it really came full circle. Uh, and that's that's one of my like greatest uh, proudest like accomplishments you know? and I and I, I don't just say that like um, you know the the Kappa scholarship that I got it by no means was like the biggest scholarship but it meant so much to me because of all my time and experience that I that had put in and so to be able to like reward you know a new wave of of you know bright high school students who are matriculating to college it was it was definitely special so um yeah 